Hello everyone. How I wish I could be with you in Athens today uh, just to talk about these unprecedented times that we're living in. Keep that word unprecedented because we're going to keep coming back to that. Um, press freedom, journalists, we are under attack globally uh, as never before and uh, from what we've seen here in the Philippines we were among the first in 2016 to raise the alarm that information operations on social media the weaponization of on social media is individually attacking journalists and news organizations in a systematic and insidious manner uh, after we came out with the propaganda series in uh, 2016 I had to field more than 90 hate messages per hour. I mean, who could have thought about this, right? The cell phone that you keep in your pocket is now a way to psychologically attack you. Um, of course, we know that these types of attacks in the virtual world, the incitement to violence can often lead to real world violence. In the Philippines, what we've seen is that this kind of astroturfing of attacks are repeated by government proxies that somehow make it to proxy news organizations. Uh, in the Philippines, we've seen that happen. And then finally, top down, the attacks that happened on social media about a year and a half later are echoed in President Duterte's State of the Nation address in the case of Rappler. Um, so why is this important? Well, we're not alone. This is happening not just in the Philippines, but in many other countries around the world. In November 2017, freedomhouse.org said that at least 28 nations around the world were feeling democracy pushed back by cheap armies on social media. A year later, the Oxford Computational Propaganda Project said that there are, it doubled that number to 48 countries around the world. Uh, this is an incredibly fast pace of exponential lies where these lies that are said a million times when you say it that often becomes something completely new and becomes fact this is where the attack against journalists become the attack against democracy by attacking facts without facts you don't have truth without truth you cannot have trust this is the biggest problem we face around the world today, this battle for truth. How did all this happen? Well, it happened because social media technology platforms took over the distribution of news. And we see this happen around 2015, the end of 2015. And we felt the impact immediately in 2016. President Duterte was elected in May. Less than a month later, you had Brexit. After that, in November, the election of President Trump in the United States, the Catalan presidential elections, blah, 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 all the way through. You guys know it. Um, sorry, the Catalan elections, not presidential. This is something that we all have to deal with at a macro level and a micro level. So why is that important, this distribution? Well, when the social media technology platforms took over distribution, they forgot the most critical part of what news organizations do, the gatekeeping role, making sure that the lies, that the manipulations do not make it into the information ecosystem. Now it is as easy, it is faster to spread a lie using hate and anger than it is to actually get the truth out get the facts out because one of the things journalists have always known is that you know facts are kind of boring right so when you lace a lie with anger and direct it with hate it travels at a velocity that reaches a far larger audience than the fact checking that happens afterwards so what are we going to do well <laughs> this is one of the first times where local is global and global is local. Think about it this way. Just Facebook and WhatsApp alone all together have 2.7 billion accounts, right? So a lie that's told in Athens today reaches the Philippines in the next second. Um, and we've seen conspiracy theories play on the worst of human nature, on our fear and anger, and destroy. Uh, systems of governance systematically, much like we've seen here in the Philippines. <sighs> what else can we do? 
Well, we've certainly, um, in the last week, I was just at one IFRA where I sat on a panel after the golden pen of freedom was given to Jamal Khashoggi. I sat on a panel where the Philippines was represented along with India, along with Brazil, along with Yemen and Saudi Arabia. And in every single one of our countries, you see the same problem happening. This requires a global solution. Um, think about the time post-World War II when humanity had to get together to protect itself from the worst of what we can do as people. Um, here's a great example. You're going to hear similar stories as what I've lived through from Rana Ayub, who's on the panel today, but also our moderator, Christophe Delois, has helped craft a global solution. Um, it is the Information and Democracy Commission. Christophe uh, sits as the chair of this co-chair along with Nobel laureate Shirin Ebadi. Um, I'm one of the 25 commissioners from 18 different nations. We're journalists, we're technologists, artists, Nobel laureates, economists. This commission has tried to come together to come out with, I guess you would call it values, right? The standards and ethics for this new age, something that could protect the information ecosystem, that could help us in the battle for truth. And over that time period, Christophe has worked very hard. Um, I watched five different heads of state led by uh, French President Emmanuel Macron um, last year in Paris. And now there are at least 12 nations that have signed on to this, this agreement. At the same time, we're looking to grow. We need a global solution to these local problems that are putting journalists increasingly under attack. I wish I was there with you, but I know that you'll learn a lot from what both Rana and Christoph have to say. Um, we here from Rappler are hoping for the best, working for the best, because we believe that democracy brings out the best of humanity. I'm Maria Ressa from Rappler in the Philippines. Have a good day.